Okay, so um, we're going to do this tag teaming. And uh, yesterday you saw a whole lot of nonsense about me if you came to my talk. Um, I've been around for a while. And, uh, you know, you have to figure out when I show you the money in this, in this talk whether it was worth your while. Um, I am the lead for SDL architecture at Intel Security, which is a BU at Intel. And uh, I got 70 architects that I work with. Security architects, that is. And um, I know Dell from a lot of things, but um, basically we're both on uh, the IEEE's Center for Secure Design. Is that good? Yep. Hit it. Uh, so uh, my name is Jim Del Grosso. I work for Sigital. I run the architecture analysis practice there, uh, which pretty much means I spend all of my, or well, almost all of my time, um, helping companies find flaws in the designs of systems. So we have groups that do things like penetration testing, we have groups that do code review, and we have a group that does architecture analysis, and groups that do all kinds of things. So for those that came earlier this week, you know, there's all different activities for software security initiatives. Um, threat modeling and architecture analysis is one of those activities. So what this talk is going to cover is six kind of, we, we just call them six myths. Um, we work with lots of different organizations. We work with you know, lots of different folks in different you know, capacities. Sometimes we hear these, I don't know, myth, excuse, whatever word you want to call it, as to why threat modeling can't be done. So we wanted to talk about six common uh, myths about threat modeling. And, and as Brooke said, uh, we do work with the IEEE Center for Secure Design. Um, just a quick little plug for that. If you're interested in helping with that group, it's the IEEE. It's, you know, it's open to the public. Anybody can join. Uh, do a search for Center for Secure Design with IEEE, you'll hit their site. It's, I think they've gotten better about how you can actually volunteer for it. It used to be a little squirrely to try to figure out how you volunteer, but send an email to one of their you know, email addresses and you can get involved if you want. Uh, what the Center for Secure Design is focusing on by its name is secure design things. They are only looking and focusing on the design of software in all kinds of you know, aspects. So if you're interested. So we, we didn't really number these, but the first myth. Uh, that we come across is we already do pen tests um, with tools and with people. We are totally covered. You don't need to do anything else. Um, I could say this after every one of these myths. That's total nonsense, but we'll not actually say that. Um, so just a couple things to think about if you are doing, if you're one of those folks that say we're doing pen testing, we're covered, we're good. So did you actually pen test the entire system or application? Was it really the whole thing that got pen tested? We see how companies get bitten in real life where parts of the app or parts of the system maybe got tested, but not the entire thing. There's, there's a lot to a complex system. How much of it really got pen tested? Um, if you're going to invest, uh, based on some data I've been hearing this week, it sounds like a week or three is actually maybe a pretty large number. Even if you're spending a week or two or three pen testing a large system, I mean, realistically, do you think you're finding all the defects that exist with that pen test? Highly unlikely. If you're using a tool or a person, can you find every defect with a pen test? Again, almost every one of these answers should be no in your head. That's not possible to do that. Um, when you're doing a release or for each app, are you always pen testing the entire system? Again, a part of it or the whole thing? It, it just kind of depends. So maybe you're one of those more advanced folks or more advanced groups where you're also doing code reviews. We're not just doing pen tests. We're also doing code reviews. That is great news. That is another, you know, it's another capability in a software security initiative. It's going to find different things. That's really good. So you're doing code reviews too. So let's look at the previous slide and see how this now plays out with code review. Well, did you code review the whole system? Right, you can take every one of these questions and go through the exact same cycle. I mean, did you code review the whole system? Did you find every defect with a code review? Is the person going to be able to find it? I mean, no, 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 no. It's almost always no. So every time there's a change, are you doing a code review of just what changed? Do you actually know how that change impacts something else? Probably the answer is no. So when we think about pen testing and code review, they're finding specific types of defects, totally necessary to do. You don't get a, you don't get a pass on that. You do need to do those activities. But um, I would be... I feel pretty confident when I say pen test and code review is not going to find the flaw that allows your HVAC vendor to access your data center. It's not going to be found through a pen test and a code review, most likely. 
I would feel pretty comfortable saying it's not going to find the flaw where you use the confidentiality control where an integrity control was supposed to be there. If you're looking at gibberish data from a pen test point of view and have no idea what it's really supposed to be, you can't tell encrypted data from Mac data. You, you don't know what the data is. You just know it's garbage. But if I know I need to prevent tampering, encryption's not the answer, right? I need a Mac of some sort. Um, pen test and code review is not going to find that missing audit control that's keeping track of people accessing critical systems. It's not going to find it. You have to be doing something else. So the fact that you're doing a pen test, the fact that you're doing a code review, great news. There's about 18 other things you have to do. This is one of them. You need to do threat modeling or something that looks at the secure design. So the, the myth that I'm doing this one thing and I'm good, no, no, not true. You have to do others. Got to do this type of stuff. Thanks. Uh, just to add, and that is pen test at the state of the art today is a very unique combination of tool and tester. No two pen tests are equivalent. So that's kind of, you have to sort of put that in your head and think, wow, uh, threat modeling is the same, but um, you're getting one or two testers and you're getting their unique combination. And so you, it's easy to, to have two pen tests, they're not comparable. So it's a point in time and it's a useful test, don't get me wrong, but the problem is you, you, it, it can't be used all alone because it's so unique, that's one. Two, um, it's awfully late. In order to pen test, you have to have the complete system. And if you can drive, and we'll, we'll talk about this myth in a moment, but if you can drive something else around design much earlier, it's way better because you might actually catch stuff when you can do something about it. Totally agree. Okay. So then we come to, I don't want a threat model. My system's built. It's already deployed. You know, what am I going to learn here? Is this useful? Nah, because that was a design thing and we missed it. So we're good. Besides, we pen tested. Let's go to the, the next slide. So do you like living in the dark? We're supposed to be security people and do due diligence, right? Even, yeah, I always consider my job being someone who has to raise risk. If I can solve the risk and mitigate it, great. But if I cannot, at least people ought to know what they've deployed. So that's like the first thing. Um, you won't know and your attackers will know because they'll be probing your system and finding out all of its weaknesses for you and then it will be late. Uh, can we advance to the next slide? But more than that, um, you want a system to be your threat model to be holistic. Now, there is one thing about this that I will note. If you're doing very standard applications and they are going right down the standard track and you've already gotten that together and you really do understand your infrastructure and how it works, you can avoid, not every application in every context needs threat modeling. So with that, place that to the side and then consider the situation where you don't have that. Then you're sitting in a situation where you don't have a whole picture and threat models work better holistically, you know, sort of like getting here, you sit in the full lotus position and you consider everything. Uh, next slide, please. And um, if you understand, even if you have to deploy a bunch of stuff that's ugly and scary, at least you can plan to the future and you can also monitor that which is present better. So you can react better knowing what your limitations are and what the problems are than just saying, I, I, I don't know. I have no idea what it is. You can react and, and monitor and be on top of what your limitations are and be there rather than just kind of guessing or doing what the industry does. Really, this stuff is very situational and so you want to be very specific if you can be. Um, and so also you can drive to the desired security posture over time if you know what the problem is today. I think I have one more slide maybe, yeah. So uh, this is sort of a recommendations in this situation. You can use exceptions and risk assumptions to kind of, you know, bridge the gap as it were. You're not really doing anything, but at least you're making the people who are responsible for having not threat modeled aware of that and guaranteeing action in the future, which is better than nothing. But also 
when you get a whole lot of exceptions, you can say, look, that be you. They just have tons of exceptions. What's wrong with those folks? You know, And you can go to their management. You can go to your management. You can get everybody starting to talk at the, at the more senior level and get them to you know, start problem solving around that. Um, and, you know, I'll just quote Brad Arkin, never waste a crisis. In this case, I would say never waste an exception because that's leverage. And, and just to add on to that, again, with this whole idea that the system's already built, it's, it's too late. Clearly, there's a huge advantage to do this activity at the beginning of, of the creation of some software. But the thing to remember is if you haven't done this type of activity, it doesn't matter when you do it. It's going to find things that cannot be found any other way. There is never too late. If you've got stuff deployed, but you didn't do this type of analysis, the flaws are there. It, they didn't magically disappear because you didn't you know, peek under the covers and, and see what's going wrong. They're there, so you should peek under the covers and see what's wrong so that you can, if nothing else, and again, we're, I'm sure neither of us are, are saying that you should go fix maybe some of the things you find, but at least you'll stop doing the bad behavior. Right? If you, if you look for these flaws, even at systems that are deployed, and you see that you did something that maybe wasn't as good as it could be, or we now know something and we want to do something better, you can take that information and at least take the next system that you're going to build or the next app that you're going to build and take those better, you know, those, those, those better ways of doing things into the next versions of software. So whether you choose to fix things or not, okay, that's a business choice. But not knowing that they're there, that's that's kind of a bad, it's kind of a bad idea. Well, they're, they're there. Someone's going to find them. Yes, and probably someone you don't want. There's a question there. Um, from an ideal timing perspective in the SDLC, when would you recommend is the ideal? When you have enough architecture, if you don't mind if I take that, when you have enough architecture to understand the flows and the major building blocks, um, and uh, and it's not so set that you can't change it. So it's a, it's a delicate balance. But I would also say a threat model is a living document. When you change the architecture, even some design choices will change the threat model. And so it's not something you do once, ideally. It's something you revisit and work with teams. And if you're in an agile environment, it is critical that people revisit the threat model because stuff changes in an agile environment. You want to learn from your coding. You want to learn from the design and say, ah, that's crappy design. Let's go down a different path. Well, what happens is security people tend to think, I've got your requirements. Don't you dare touch them. But that's antithetical to what can happen in an agile environment where your security might get better too. So let it breathe. Let it revisit it. Keep revisiting it. The problem there becomes, when is it done? And that's a tricky question. Let's not take it up unless you want to hit it. No, we'll get to that in a sec. But, but yeah, as far left in the SDLC as is normal, certainly when you're, you're going to go through the normal design process. So when you're having that part of the conversation, that's when you want to be thinking about who's going to try to break into the system. And if you've got security requirements, great. Those are going to work into the thinking. If you can think about misuse and abuse cases, those are going to work into your thinking. Because if you can do it at the beginning, you may actually have to change the design. You may have to change requirements. There may be requirements that are being laid down by the business that are impossible to do securely that they just don't recognize. So if you can go to them with a the business case and say, hey, I know you wanted this requirement, but oh, by the way, you're going to create this vulnerable situation that there isn't really a good solution for, maybe they'll change their thinking. Maybe they'll change the requirements. Maybe they'll not you know, put all of this sensitive data on a device that cannot be protected. You mean that, that requirement that says system will be secure, and then that other requirement that says system yeah. will be easy to use. Yeah, writing security. Don't you love those? I have actually seen those multiple times in my career. Yes, writing, Both of those. Writing security requirements is an <laughs> art unto itself. Yeah, telling me to secure the database doesn't really help me. <laughs> so whatever. <laughs> all right. Uh, so another myth is uh, we already did the threat model when it was built, right? We followed, uh, we followed the advice we've heard at various talks, and we built the system, we did the threat model. Uh, we don't ever have to do this again. Again, uh, no. <laughs> uh, there are lots of reasons that you want to come back and revisit. Uh, Brooke just kind of alluded to one example where did something change in the system? Uh, when something does change in the system, you may not have to revisit the entire threat model, but what do you need to revisit? 
well, the parts of the system that are affected by the change. So you need to know about things like, you know, the attack surface. Where can somebody break, you know, where is somebody going to try to attack the system? Did I create a new, a new entry point, a new place for somebody to attack the system? Is there something now of value that wasn't there before that I know somebody is now incented to try to go get to? Uh, are we going to use a control that has a historically difficult problem to actually do well? Right? This is all the kinds of things that we can take into our decision making of do we need to do the threat model again? So, you know, features being added, remove change, of course, um, as you ask yourself that question, uh, maybe the answer is yes, maybe the answer is no. Um, in either case, um, it doesn't matter if nothing has changed in your software. The, the universe is changing all the time. Your software is built on top of other software. And lo and behold, that software has problems with it. And sometimes those problems are severe enough that we have to put a compensating control in our design to deal with some other piece of broken software. Has anybody ever had to do that? There are some vulnerability found. Yeah. Really? Never, only one? never, yeah, never, yeah. never. Never happens. It, it happens. It absolutely happens. So something breaks in either a framework, of course, the, the OS level. Uh, so when we talk about threat modeling, I'm, I'm pretty much at application layer, but obviously you can threat model all kinds of things. You can threat model the network, you can threat model the building, you can threat model all kinds of things. But even if you're only at application layer security, it's still kind of interesting to know if there's a, some sort of vulnerability in the operating system that matters to how you're interacting with the OS. Generally, we're higher than that, but obviously things like frameworks, totally in play. If there's a vulnerability in Rails or you know JBoss or whatever you happen to be using, well, that matters if the vulnerability can be exploited from a threat agent, by interacting with the attack surface somehow, all of, you have to be looking for these kinds of things. So when we discover these new vulnerabilities out in the world, we have to at least be thinking, does that change my threat model? So even if my stuff didn't change, I still have to think about this. So that's one aspect, but we also discover new types of attacks. Right, so when there's a new attack that's discovered, and this is why if you look at like, you know, software security initiative capabilities, things like threat intelligence is one of those things. Somebody somewhere is hopefully keeping track of new ways of attacking systems. When there's a new way to attack some piece of software, some way to break into something, we gotta come back and revisit the threat model. Does that matter to what we're doing? Maybe the answer is no, maybe the answer is yes, but sticking your head in the sand isn't really a good solution. Okay, is it too impossible? That's a fair question. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll see what I can do here. Let's go on to the next slide. So first off, start with something simple. Stride's been out there for years, I think close to eight years, something like that. Um, and that's, you know, a place to start. Uh, you can try Atasm, which is in my book. Um, it's really simple to think about because I need something really simple because I'm dumb. Um, and, and this is what those things mean, atasm. Or, you know, stride, whatever. Um, just get started is maybe the, the basic message going here. And start simple, start easy. So one of the big mistakes I see a lot is people think, okay, this is important. So therefore, we're going to have to build 250 page architectural documents that then sit on a shelf and nobody ever reads them. Don't do that. Uh, really, you'll find out what you need once you get started. It may be that you just have drawings that show where the, threat, the attack surfaces are and lists of requirements and mitigations. That's enough and it's really easy to do. When I'm really pushed and shoved, I got 15 threat models I have to complete in a week. Um, that's all I do is I list the requirements and all the mitigate existing mitigations because the threat model can be inferred from that and you know that the work is done. That's all you need. So start really simple. Stay away from my personal styles. Stay away from long lists that aren't going to be used that nobody's ever going to look at again. Um, in time, you'll know what you need. You know, if you, if you have a very uh, a process that needs to be very assured because you have regulations or whatever, then you might need more documentation, but you'll figure that out. And I'll also say that creative people love puzzles. When you give a bunch of creative, innovative people, like software developers often are, not always, but often are, and you give them a puzzle and you say, hey, here's a puzzle, let's figure this out, you get a lot more engagement. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, oh. yep. Um, avoid 
falling into the classic engineer's trap of saying, oh my God, if I don't do this completely, I haven't done it, therefore I shouldn't even get started. Remember, one serious flaw, which is the way Dell and his crew like to call, call them, but one serious miss in the architecture that you haven't mitigated, attack surface that's unmitigated, that has profound effects, um, if you get that out of there, you're one step closer to better. And so, you know, if you catch one thing at first, that's good. Um, and so, you know, avoid falling in the trap that I shouldn't start this because I, I can't get anything done. You will get something. Um, one of the things that is kind of an interesting story, when I first got to McAfee um, f three and a half years ago, uh, a team said, we're, gonna, we're, we're training ourselves how to do threat modeling, and so we want you to review this threat model we did. And while they had missed an important attack surface, so I did add value to that discussion, they had gotten most of them really, really well. And they, I wanted to impress them with, guys, you should be really proud of yourselves that you did this much great work, rather than haranguing on the one miss that they'd gotten. It was an important miss, but nevertheless, you know, I've done well over a thousand threat models in my career. So it's fast for me. You can't expect people when they're first starting doing that. Okay, um, over time, you know, your experience is going to increase and you'll get better results. And because these are living documents, just let people keep revisiting them. Let's go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, I can't deny that being a master threat modeler requires significant experience. Usually, not always, but usually years of experience and hundreds of architectures. Okay, but both Dell and I have trained hundreds of people to do this. And those people are all delivering valuable results. So, you know, don't be afraid to just get in there and get going. My starter classes are just two hours long. Ask me why that's true at Intel Security, because there's some assumptions I can make um, that you can't necessarily make, um, you know, if you're going in cold. But ask me, you know, I don't want to go into that now. Um, let me see what the next slide is. Um, apply your senior people like scalpels, like surgeons. Um, one of the greatest things you can do is you start people off and they work on, uh, sort of under the tutelage, but they get to go and you get rev layers of review and that's a way you can take one or two really experienced threat modelers and scale them to hundreds of projects because you get all these other people doing it, but then the people who are a little more experienced review their stuff and then they can turn to the experts who revere their stuff. And you can get layers of, of hierarchy here to scale to, to literally hundreds of projects fairly quickly. Um, and, and the other thing I will say is this journey is a long journey. I play a very long game. So, um, you know, when I first start, I tell management, look, nobody knows how to threat model. That's okay. You're going to get a lot of mistakes. I'll try to keep the terrible things from happening. You know, that's why you hired me. But let people learn, let them make some mistakes, let, them, let, let it go, and we'll, we'll get better. And I've done it four times now with different organizations, and I'm pretty convinced this works. This is a model that's really scalable because you're not going to be able to hire 20 great threat modelers. You'd be lucky if you can hire two. Any additions? Uh, no, that's, that's, that is probably exactly right. It's, it is absolutely a teachable thing to a point. Um, I think one of the I think one of the harder things about this is uh, it's actually kind of it's a kind of interesting it's it's the next myth we're going to get to but w without jumping too far ahead it, it it is a skill that can be taught again to a point I don't think you can I think nobody here would agree that anybody can become a good software architect right not everyone is melt is meant to build systems um, some people are just better coders than they are builders and designers of systems very true so you should. And there's there's better coders than there are testers, and there's better testers than there are insert your other you know activity. So don't treat this as something different that uh, you know anybody can do threat modeling. No, uh, we can teach anybody to do it, but not everyone will succeed, right? I can try to teach everyone how to be a race car driver, and some people will crash and burn, and they shouldn't be driving race cars. So there's there there are some skills that are that can be taught. Uh, it's still something that ha this is uh, we just call it apprenticeship at our place. Um, where it is one of those things, I think there's apprenticeship in any activity. Um, unless you've got some natural ability, you probably didn't just 
turn up one day and become this great pen tester, you've got this natural ability to think think maliciously, and you you get very good at breaking into systems. But you built out those skills over time. Uh, coding is maybe a little different, but not not much. You still take time, and you become a good coder. Um, threat modeling and looking at secure designs, understanding where are the likely places that some weakness could exist in the design of a system, that you're gonna develop that over time. Just like people know, I don't know, it's, I guess the, the closest thing I can equate it to is you know, kind of chess. You play chess more and more with people that are better, better than you, you get better at chess. You will stop making bad choices. Do you know why you make bad choices? No, you're not a machine. You can't figure out 35 moves ahead that that's gonna bite you in the ass. Well, threat modeling and, and making secure design choices is kind of the same thing. You just stop making bad decisions earlier, and so you don't back yourself into a corner, but that's how you learn. Back yourself into a corner, back out, and then for you, the next time you do it, you're not gonna go down that path. You will learn to stop doing bad things. Now, there are people that will not learn to do bad things. Those are the people that cannot be threat modelers. <laughs> well, it's, and it's I, a teachable I'll, thing. I'll note that, you know, coding on, and highly uh, recursive B-tree is not the same as hello world. Correct. <laughs> All right, so um, <clears throat> another myth. Uh, we don't have software security experts, so we can't do threat modeling. So it's this kind of sort of true slash myth. Um, you don't have to be the crypto wizard. You don't have to be you know, the guy that can recite you know, CVE frontward and backwards and know every vulnerability that exists. Uh, is it good to know that stuff? Absolutely. The more you know, the better it is. Um, we would rather take uh, a good coder and someone who has like you know built systems and teach them security than someone who comes in with a security only background and try to teach them how to build systems or where things can be broken. That is way harder to do. So we can, you can learn security. Uh, it's very difficult to learn design. If you've got good design skills, uh, we can teach you the breaking part. The breaking part can come along. There will be different techniques. I'm sure we teach our folks differently than you know, Brooke does. So there's lots of different ways you can teach this skill. But it's, it's just because you don't have you know, a person who is the security guru doesn't mean you can't do some stuff. You know, you know enough about security that you're going to know where certain things could go wrong. And it could be as big as, let's not put a security control on the client. Even if you're not a security expert, you know that's dumb. You're not going to want to do that. But if you're not thinking about a system because somebody didn't sit down and think about where is this control really going to live, it's like, well, it's going to live in this you know, piece of JavaScript that we're going to download to the client. It's like, well, that's dumb. If you, you know, it's going to not be in a place where you can control where it's going to execute. You have to, be, you, have, you have to have some knowledge, of course. You have to know how some attacks work, but you don't have to be the security guru. If you are a security guru, great. You'll do better, most likely, at this. Um, so there's, we don't have security experts, okay, but certainly different types of systems have got completely different types of ways to break into it. So even if I'm a good, uh, you know, if I'm a good threat model of a web application, I may be really bad at threat modeling a medical device. It's, it's not, I got domain experience I don't have. There are things that are still gonna matter, right? I still understand attack surface, I still understand assets, I still understand controls. I have to now map in my head, what does that look like in a medical device? What does that look like in a mobile application? So I can still take a bunch of skills and apply them to different domains. So even though I don't have the security expertise of a particular platform, I can still function. And of course, these ex levels of experience are all over the map. Just like you have good coders, bad coders, good testers, bad testers. So one way I try to look at this, um, we, used to, we used to tell our folks, think like an attacker, and, and that kind of didn't make so much sense. It's like trying to tell them how to be a good cook. So I kind of thought about this for a minute, and it's like, well, maybe threat modeling is kind of like cooking. If you suck at cooking, you can maybe boil water, right? I can boil water, I can whatever, make some rice, and that's about it. And maybe I'm a master chef, and I can do a lot of really good things. Just like I can become, well, I can most likely become better at cooking if I actually cared and didn't like Cheerio so much. Um, I could probably become better as a chef over time. And the more you do, the better you'll get. The more types of systems you, threat, you, know, you do this activity for, you'll get better. Uh, the more types of frameworks you look like, you'll, you'll get better. You'll start to think about things and ask the right questions. Um, you should be doing this all the time. Right? Anytime we're, we have a change in the system, we want to think about this, you at least need to boil water. Right? You have to be doing something. 
If you do this activity, I can almost guarantee you will find something. You will find a flaw in the system that you did not know was there. Just, just because uh, we are not infallible. <clears throat> we build systems that have these flaws in them. I would almost guarantee it. We have never done this activity on a system and not found a flaw. That's in 10 years. Well, Hasn't happened. So the one thing I would say, what was I gonna say? Now I got lost in the stupid thing. Um, I forget it, you I lost it. You have found one. Oh yeah, no, I have found, I have found, I have found a system uh, every once in a while, and this is why I take a very listen first attitude. Because I let them explain to me what their security is, and often it's, well, we have HTTPS, TLS, so aren't we secure? And, you know, it's like the big peanut butter, as I said yesterday. But uh, ignoring that, occasionally they describe their, their threat model and their controls, and I go, wow, you got everything covered. Every once in a while. People do think about this, um, and they're trying. So, you know, I find it's very useful to encourage people. So, my experience is slightly different than yours. Yep, I haven't had that yet. Oh, you're up next. So. Oh, all right. So, all right. Um, so, let's let's look at the other way. We've looked at this way. I'm pen testing. Now, let's let's turn that around. The inverse. Um, so, if I'm doing threat modeling, I don't have to do all this other stuff, right? No silver bullets, please, no silver bullets. The reason at the current state of the art, the reason that an SDL is actually kind of complex and assigning the right activities is a complex activity that should be done by an expert, at least in part. Um, although we've made some, I've made some strides in my career around doing some stuff deterministically. Um, uh, there's still expert opinion there. The reason that is, is because it's complex and none of these things is a silver bullet, but not only that, they're complementary and synergistic. So a threat model is a design time activity. A pen test is a last before I go to production to make sure I didn't screw up in all my other SDL activities. It's the final often or near the final validation that I actually got from the attacker's view as close as I could to my security posture that I want to get to. Uh, next slide. Please. Oh, and it takes a village to do an SDL. Very important little, little um, thing I like to make. It takes a lot of experts to really execute the SDL, a complete SDL well. And uh, it should not be a solo activity. Okay, um, you get synergies and complementary things. I listed the design time activities here, or at least how I like to divide it up. Um, and you notice I included code review, because a good code reviewer can sometimes find design flaws by reading the code. And so while the code reviews tend to be focused on logic and implementation errors, they can sometimes also find design issues as well. So it's kind of in there you know, you should have some people who can look at the design through the code, because that helps. But these other three activities are part of the design. You do a risk assessment or analysis at the very beginning, if it's ideal. Um, even when the product manager is saying, I want this bunch of features or I want this new widget. You want to look at that and say, huh, how will people likely attack this and what do customers expect for security in this thing? And get a bunch of very high level things. You'll need authentication, you'll need authorization. You know, I'll need to protect the financial data. Some of that really high level stuff. And you can get that into the requirements. And as I said yesterday, early requirements get the mind share. So that's important. Um, and then you threat model when you're a little bit further along and you come up with some more, much more specific stuff. And then you want to take a look at the design somewhere along the, the way or continuously as it changes in agile environment and say, hmm, how's the security? Thanks very much. Um, so, you know, these things are not the, each of these is not the same thing. It's a little different and they add to each other and they're dependent on each other. Next slide, please. Um, and so pen testing generally and static analysis and uh, they, they, they're looking for a different class of problems. Implementation errors, coding bugs, logic errors if the pen tester's real good but not all pen testers will come up with the real logic errors, but some of them will. So it's a different class of bugs in, in, in general than design misses. Oh, our authentication, the credentials are all available in the, in the database and we designed it so that the 
keys for the encryption of the credentials are sitting right in the database right next to the right next to the the things that are encrypted. Ooh, that's a bad design. Or we decided to design it with one universal uh, credential, like a certificate or a password, that Juniper thing I had up there the other day. Whatever. Um, those are design issues, and they're not going to be found necessarily by pen test. Next. Next. Um, and just let's get really clear. The purpose of a threat model is to find out what attack surfaces and assets have not been properly protected and generate a series of requirements that then can be built or decided not to be built because you don't care, you know, whatever. The prioritization's hard, hard job there. I don't, wanna, I don't mean to, to do that. It's to get the right security stuff built. Threat mo modeling does not magically replace your SDL. So just a, a couple, I guess a couple things I got to now roll back through uh, the comments I had in my head. I got to, I got to extract them. Um, so one of the, one of the comments that was made was, um, you know, it, it's obviously not going to replace these other things, but I don't know about any, anybody here, uh, but I have absolutely worked with executives who want to, they, they love the idea of doing this secure design thing and, and they have literally, let's start doing threat modeling so I can replace my pen test program. No. Um, let's do this so we can get rid of our static analysis tool. No. It's not going to get rid of those things. In, in fact, what, what you can do with this, though, is you can use the information from this activity to make the other activities better. Right? If I'm looking at a complex system and it's got, I'm just going to arbitrarily say, it's got 50 entry points. But the fact is, 10 of those entry points are protecting 90% of the valuable information. Wouldn't that be good information for your pen testers to know? Go pound on these 10 entry points. That's where the goods are. That's good information. If I know that I've got this security control that is protecting that incredibly valuable asset, couldn't that be a good thing to make sure my static analysis tool never fails? to analyze the code that's related to that control. If you're looking at two million lines of code, and I don't know how big the systems are, and if you're using static analysis tools, but I know we work with plenty of vendor, or plenty of clients of ours, that when there's errors in the static code, if it's less than a certain percentage, you, you're not gonna invest the time to fix it. If that part of the code that wasn't being analyzed was the most critical security control to your system, go find out what's wrong. <laughs> you want that stuff scanned. All right, you, it's good information for other activities. So, um, and I can't remember the other thing. What the hell was it? <laughs> oh, 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 the, the coding and design errors. Um, so one of the slides I like to use is the overlap of pen test code review and, and design review. And, and the one very common, sadly, today, um, coding example that rears its head as a coding bug and a design problem is hard-coded creds in something, either hard-coded creds in the client, <laughs> hard-coded creds on the server, wherever the things are hard-coded. Yeah, so, yeah, that's what they are. <laughs> Any kind of key material that's going to be hard-coded somewhere. So that is, of course, an implementation bug, but what's the design flaw if you've got something hard-coded in the code? You don't have the appropriate means for tracking and Sorry, right, the answer is you don't have an appropriate means for tracking those credentials, changing them. You don't, have a, you don't have a rotation policy. What happens on a compromise? There's all kinds of things that are now kind of rearing its head as the flaw. But it is going to be found in a, in, a coding, in a code review. And there's other examples. So there, there is this bleed over. But, but don't think that if you find that kind of a thing, you're doing threat modeling. You've stumbled across a flaw by doing a code review, but code review doesn't find flaws. It, it finds bugs uh, for the most part. Well, and it's still to remediate that problem is a design problem. Then you yes. Have to design something to protect the credentials. That's yes. sort of my point. So, uh, there's other types of issues with this, uh, to be sure, but just to turn the floor over for questions. Any kind of questions? I don't know if you, are you guys seeing any of these kind of, a, kind of, a, oh, I know what the one last thing was, sorry. <laughs> just because I just thought of it. Um, so uh, along these lines of, uh, you know, will this replace our, our other thing, when a vendor comes to you and says, let's slap this appliance in front of your web server because it's going to find these types of defects so you don't have to do this stuff yourself, run, run and hide. Run. Right? Run. It's not, it may be very good at what it does, you still have to do the other stuff. Yeah. Right? And this is one of those other things. And as far as I know, there is no tool that does this. You know, this is done by humans. Can I say something? And 
with all due respect to the vendors that are here, many of whom are my personal friends, and I, I respect their work greatly, um, but uh, there's a lot of hype. Be suspicious of the hype. No point tool is going to, quote, solves your security problem. Just walk around in RSA San Francisco on the vendor floor, about one half to two thirds of the signs say something of the order, world's greatest will solve your security problem. Be suspicious, be nasty, and also say to that marketing person, take that sign down. Because obviously, a static analyzer doesn't solve your security problem. It's a key piece in my world of my SDL, but it doesn't replace threat modeling. It doesn't replace dynamic analysis. They're complementary. Each thing, an authentication system does not solve your security problem. It solves the authentication problem, which is one kind of control, which is a very complex control, by the way. Think about authentication. The moment you stick authentication in there, have you protected anything? Answer is no. You've reduced, reduced the attack surface. Why? Because an authenticated user, especially if you think about a Facebook situation, they know darn well that their authentication does nothing because you can get an address and start up an account. How many birds and dogs have accounts on Facebook? Um, I haven't met the dog that actually uses Facebook, by the way, um, or bird. So, you know, think about that. It's very easy to get an account. So they know that at Facebook perfectly well. They know their authentication is just a way of saying, ah, that account is misbehaving. I ought to kill it. That's all its usefulness is from a security perspective. So authentication, you got to think about how good is your credential, how good is your trust of the principal that's using that authentication. All of that's very important, but authenticated users do attack systems. Therefore, you have to think it's just a way of closing or tying, you know, it's, it's complex. And you also have the problem of securing the authentication, which is a whole big problem. So, you know, just taking that one thing is, is a way of thinking about this. You know, all of these things sit in a place in an SDL at today's art. Questions? We got one right here. So how does this sort of model you talked about, of like doing the, the threat models and the pen tests work into sort of a continuous development workflow? Ah, that is such a great question. You want to take it or shall I take a whack at it? You have the mic. Have all right. So um, that's a great question. Uh, continuous integration, because threat modeling is an expert activity, it doesn't fit into the continuous integration. Instead, you have to make it agile, which is different. When I mean agile, I mean letting it breathe, letting it change, being living, revisiting it with human actors, thinking about these problems, and probably quite a few SMEs who understand the system in different ways. I can't tell you how many times I've come into a threat model and said, now explain the architecture to me. You guys have been living with it, but explain it to me. And one person goes to the board and they draw a bunch of stuff. And another person gets up and says, wait a minute, the system doesn't work that way. It works like this. And half the learning that's going on in that room is that the people who design that system are now becoming to really understand just exactly what they've designed and built because nobody has a complete picture. Well, by getting a bunch of experts together, you get them, you know, as an example of, of why it's important to leave that as an expert activity, that really needs humans. That's the state of the art today. May change, but today that's the state of the art. Okay, in terms of continuous integration, you want to get your tools that are checking for implementation errors, however you're doing that, get those to be part of the flow very quickly. So what we like to say is if we're gonna be doing a turnaround of one week, say, on our, on our you know, or, or daily builds, you do like, and I actually happen to know this from Salesforce because they told it to me, um, and I think it's probably pretty public information, no NDAs there, um, that what they do is they have all their tools there, but they force people into a particular architecture which has been thoroughly threat modeled. You see the difference? So you, you're writing to that threat model um, from the infrastructure, and then you're inside that pipeline looking for implementation errors and protected by the existing threat model. Want to add? Yeah, so the only thing I would say slightly different is at some point, continuous integration or not, you're, you're, you're operating on some change that you're implementing in the system. When that change was thought about, 
That is when you think about, does this change my threat model? New assets, new controls, new attack surface. Uh, you go through your laundry list of what is this change going to actually do? When the answer is it doesn't materially affect my threat model, you have done your exercise of I've revisited the threat model. If I create a new entry point, you have to revisit the threat model. If I've created a new piece of data, a new piece of functionality that a threat agent wants to get to, you've got to revisit the threat model. If you're going to change a control, add a control, you've got to revisit the threat model. So CI, um, does, does it change anything that you're doing? I don't think so. I think you have to be a little bit quicker at it. Uh, you may not spend as much time thinking about it as you would in other types of situations, but you had to design the system at some point. Um, you've got a threat model, and if you don't, you should go build one, and that's going to be a burn that you're going to invest some time that's to go build. Yeah. So you go and you build your, your threat model, you have your threat model, and then CI or not, you look at the change that you're about to make, does it affect my threat model? Yes or no? So CI is Yes, you're building stuff constantly, but based on changes. And when you're looking at those changes, that's when you ask yourself, did it change my threat model? So it totally can work. But you know, you're not going to, just like you wouldn't use a tool that takes a week to scan code in a CI environment, your, your threat model activity is going to be enough to answer these you know, important questions of, did my threat model change? You made an important point, uh, Dell, that's really important here. If you haven't done the threat model, and you've just been assuming your architecture is, you know, and you're just designing, and you're just writing to that architecture. And I, I actually just did one of these last year where they'd been doing a very successful product for years, and they'd never done a threat model of the complete system. So then you just back up and do the threat model and figure out, again, what you got and what you don't have. And then you start, you, you let the continuous integration process work to that threat model. Does that make sense? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 No Any more questions? Of course, after that, there won't be an no, there's no more. How business can, can, like, so can just speak yeah. it. How business can help us to create the uh, better thread modeling, or how business can impact the thread modeling? Because sometimes the requirement is fixed, but if we want to have a better thread modeling, we have we need to uh, improve the process, right? Yes. Um, do you want to take a yeah. gel or me? So, so a, a couple things on, on how can the business impact threat modeling. So one of the hurdles that we've seen a large number of clients come across, how, how do you measure the effectiveness of your pen test program? You run a pen test, you find 25 vulnerabilities, you run it again, you find 20, you run it again, you find 15. Your program, you're improving, the, the number of defects is decreasing. Code review, same thing. You run your code review. We found uh, 100 bugs, and it was 90, then it was 85. Hey, we're getting better. There's, there's, there's not that kind of measurement in, in the threat model world. And even when there is such a measurement, the, the impact or the, the risk rating, if you would, of a flaw you find is all over the map for different applications, for different situations. So when we're going to you know, businesses to try to tell them why do you need to do this, um, I point them to Target and I point them to Home Depot and it's like, this shit happens. So do you want to be on the front page of the paper um, that we, if we had looked at the system a certain way, we could have avoided this problem. But you have to make sure the business folks understand the metrics that exist for, for getting an ROI on this, as far as I know, they're not there. Um, we're we're going to find a problem and we're going to let you know, hey, we just found this killer problem. I um, hope that was valuable. But how do we know that we're you know, continuing to do uh, great work? I don't know. There's a long tail to architecture. And business has to understand that. There is a very long tail. And also, since CISOs and CSOs, the, the average tenure is 18 months, they're going to want to prove themselves with quick win activities. Architecture is not a quick win activity. It takes about, I've done this four times, and I'm, I'm, I'm convinced it works now with different organizations. Um, it takes about two to three years to really start seeing the results of this activity, really seeing it, especially when you get a lot of legacy code, you're going to carry a lot of legacy debt no matter what you do, and you've got to be aware of it. You know, all of that's true, but you start seeing improvements in the field. And what will happen, which is interesting, is as you start getting the low-hanging fruit from threat modeling, your attackers will begin to get frustrated and start find your high, you know, difficult, high-hanging fruit for you and you know you'll have more difficult more intractable problems so you have to sort of prepare management for that entire 
um, thing. The other thing I wanted to say is I had a big learning when I was the uh, senior security architect. Um, I had a team of eight that time, and I got a team of 70. It's a little different. I guess, my, I guess that's career growth, is it? Hmm. I'm not sure. Uh, but um, when I was at, at WebEx or Cisco, and eventually we did all the SaaS products, but that was our little test bed. Um, we uh, stumbled into, and it was a great learning, that if we could help sales make work with their security departments by understanding our security posture really, really well, that is, we had threat modeled it really, really well, then, and we could explain that and articulate it, that brought us over to product management, who then became our best friends. And so instead of being really late on the draw, or just having engineering go and do stuff without us, because product management said, wow, you guys are great when you talk to those other security people. We want to have you. We're planning this new widget. Can you guys get involved right now so we understand what our customers are going to want? Because you seem to understand that really well. So you know, get up front and be valuable to the people who sell your products, to the people who start thinking like their customers and what do the customers want. If you become valuable to them, your SDL will, your, your, all your design activities will start to flow really naturally. Because instead of chasing them, they'll be chasing you if they see you as adding value. It was a very powerful lesson, and I will never forget it. We always touch product management first now and try to start getting with them because then they start seeing us as their friend who will get stuff right and then, you know, it just is, makes life easier. That address? Yes. There? How are we on time? <coughs> Eight minutes. That time? Okay. Let's have about um, three, four minutes. Okay, so we've got so another, time for another. Any, yeah. any other questions? Oh, yes. Oh. Let me make uh, a couple of comments here. You know, one is about uh, why you, uh, I want to add one more bullet to the, uh, why you should be doing uh, the threat model continuously or, you know, revisit. One is that the value of the assets change over time, okay. right? Assets meaning like anything that you're protecting. I mean, case in point is the social security numbers. They used to be liberally used as an ID at some point, but now, you know, social security numbers are to be, yep. Don't do uh, that. <laughs> okay. Makes people mad. I and, always consider my social security number long since I'm 65. <laughs> May I get yours? <laughs> sure, you want it? No. Five, five, no, thank you. And so the second thing I wanted to add is like, you know, with Dell's help and Sigital's help, I, I had talked a lot of classes at Interior about, uh, you know, how uh, teaching people how to do threat modeling and uh, type of people who make great threat modelers are people who have architectural mindset and people who have QA mindset, right? Sometimes you find that in one person, you're lucky, but a lot of times, you know, you find that in two different people. So your task is kind of to uh, have these two guys work together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In fact, what I discovered, can I have the mic? Um, this is important. What I discovered after doing 47 threat modeling trainings, participatory, like sort of like what I was doing yesterday, but, but deeper um, and longer, is that threat modeling, if you're building a program, it's a key activity for the SDL. And this is sort of magical. I don't understand why yet. But if you get everybody on the team involved, at least listening to the threat model, they suddenly understand why the other SDL activities matter and they take it seriously it's it's if there's magic in the world it's right here um that in, or magic in security it's right here there's something social that i don't understand completely or psychological that goes on if you get everybody to threat model they will walk away and they look at the test plan and there's a security item and they go i know why this is important and i will prioritize this and, and be effective at it. Instead of, oh, there's another thing I have to do, I don't understand what it is. They understand why, oh my gosh, if we had only gotten these requirements earlier, it would have been better on the design side. And I need to be involved in the building of the architecture. It's, you know, it doesn't matter what the role is. They all know, have to know how to keep secrets. It used to be the threat model was the most secret thing, or very secret. Um, we have abandoned that. Because we believe that everyone on the engineering team already knows they have to keep what they're building secret until it's announced. They already do that. If they break that, they've broken their contract with Intel. So they, you know, that's a problem. That's a management problem. So by involving everyone in the, in the, in the threat model, 
we're getting this whole excitement about the SDL that I haven't ever been able to achieve any other way. You want to add anything, Del? Yeah, I'm good. That's a great point. Thank you. Any Ooh. questions? All right. I think we're good. Um, we'll be around. Thanks, yep. Thanks very much.